everyone. Welcome to Amago Season 1, Episode 42. You've been given glory. I'm your host, Vanessa Brown. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Welcome again, everyone. And this evening, I want to talk about you been given glory. We've been talking about over the past few weeks about possessions and positions, and I didn't realize how far this topic would take me. But every time I think I'm finished with it, God reveals another aspect of the conversation. So in episode 41, last week, we talked about being processed for position. I spent some time talking about pride, um, and the Greek word for pride is zadon. It means insolence, presumptuousness, and arrogance, arrogance towards man, and presumptuousness uh, or godless disobedience to uh, God and to God's servants. The Hebrew word for pride means to boil up or to seethe. Um, And since we're supposed to be a reflection of Christ, we cannot be in the positions that are prepared for us unless this pride has been processed out of us. So we have to go through circumstances and situations that rid us of pride. Now, the opposite of pride is humility, which means to be bowed down or afflicted. And the dictionary tells us um, it means to have a modest or a low view of one's own importance. Going through affliction will definitely make someone who's arrogant and presumptuous change their opinion of themselves. Self-esteem is your opinion of yourself. So besides having a modest or low view of one's own importance, Some people take it a step further and have this issue with their self-esteem, their opinion of themselves. Low self-esteem is different from humility because it is when someone lacks confidence about who they are and what they can do. Um, When a person has low self-esteem, they often feel incompetent, unloved, or inadequate. According to Better Health Channel, people with low self-esteem are extremely critical of themselves. They downplay or they ignore their positive qualities. Uh, They judge themselves to be inferior to their peers. They use negative words to describe themselves, words like, I'm stupid, I'm fat, I'm ugly, or I'm unlovable. Also, people with low self-esteem have these um, conversations with themselves. We call it self-talk. Um, that are always negative. They're critical of themselves. They often blame themselves. And people with low self-esteem also assume that if anything good happens to them, it's not because of their effort, but it's because of luck or chance. When things do go wrong, um, instead of taking into account all of the variables that could have made something go wrong, they tend to take it upon themselves. and they don't they don't give themselves uh, i want to say a break they don't give themselves a break if something does go wrong they don't believe when people give them a compliment they don't believe it's genuine and they have a very hard time of course accepting compliments so what i wanted to do in this episode is i wanted to minister to those people people who are struggling with low self esteem and for those of us who don't struggle with low self-esteem and and walk in humility, I wanted us to know what low self-esteem looks like so that we can help our brothers and our sisters who struggle in this area. Some people try to mask low self-esteem in humility, but the two are very different. A person who operates in humility knows who they are and what they are capable of, but they make a decision 
to honor others more highly than themselves because of this knowing and because of their confidence, they don't have a problem honoring other people above themselves or esteeming others more highly is how the Bible puts it. However, a person with low self-esteem is, does not have that quality. Now, low self-esteem is not something that anyone is born with. Low self-esteem happens. It, it happens from our experience. And we have to always remember that we are in a fallen world, right? So it's not that you're born with low self-esteem, but low self-esteem happens because of experiences that you have. They could be experiencing harsh criticism from uh, people in authority, um, authority figures like your parents, your teachers. Um, so being criticized a lot by those people can lead to, to low self-esteem. Being raised in an emotionally distant um, family where your caregivers are not very emotionally attached uh, can help to cause low self-esteem to develop in people. Um, and also going through trauma, childhood trauma um, also affects and can cause the development of low self-esteem. Childhood trauma, and this could be something, I don't want to call it minor, but you know, your, your parents going through divorce um, or it could be um, as detrimental as suffering some type of sexual abuse. These things lead to low self-esteem. Um, generally when people are growing up, if they have low self-esteem now, it's because they had trouble in school, um, or they may even have had some physical or mental disability. All of these are factors that can cause low self-esteem. And now, of course, today we have this whole issue with social media and how that um, causes people to have low self-esteem because on social media, you know, we make sure we've got the best pictures to put up, you know, and so people are comparing themselves to these images that are portrayed on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and those things are, are, you know, we've got filters to make them look beautiful. They're not real, but people are suffering because they are trying to live up to these ideal images. Low self-esteem, though, not only affects um, an individual internally, but it also affects their outward behavior as well. Having low self-esteem limits people's ambitions, and it oftentimes causes people to make bad choices in life. But what I want to talk about for a few minutes this afternoon or this evening is that I have good news for you if you are a person who has low self-esteem. And your answer is Jesus. So if you would, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 17. Um, and let's look at the scriptures for a little while. In John, in John chapter 17, we find Jesus praying to his father in heaven. And he makes three distinct prayers, right? He makes one prayer for himself. He makes another prayer for the apostles that are currently with him and are a part of his ministry. And then he prays for those of us who don't even know him yet. We're the people that are going to believe in the message of the apostles, and we are going to accept Christ. So as I was reading this, the Holy Spirit piqued my interest in this word, um, the word found in chapter 17, and it's the word glory, as Jesus is making these three prayers, because Jesus mentions this word within these three prayers uh, around eight times, if I counted correctly, it's like eight times. Um, first, Jesus asked God to glorify him so that he may glorify God. Then Jesus asked if he has brought, and Jesus says that he has brought glory on earth by completing the work that God gave him to do. Then Jesus asked God to glorify him in his presence with the glory that he had before the world began. Next, Jesus says that glory has come to him through the disciples. And then Jesus says that he has given glory. He has given us glory that God gave him, that he, that we may be one as they are one. Jesus asked for us to be with him, to see him 
in his glory, the glory again that he had before, um, the glory God gave him because he loved him and before the world was created. Now, I, I don't know, but the Holy Spirit just kind of grabbed my attention to this word glory because it was repeated over and over and over. And so I needed to have a full and a better understanding of what glory is because we use it all the time. But do we fully understand what the word means? And so when I researched and looked up glory, glory is defined in several ways by Bible scholars and the theologians, but the word that it comes from, the Greek word is doxa. Um, and doxa means exercising personal opinion, which determines value. Exercising personal opinion, which determines value. And generally, if you ever see that word, it in the New Testament, it is always a positive personal opinion, right? It is an opinion, it's praise, it's honor, it's glory. Glory is also, here's another definition, God's infinite intrinsic worth, God's substance and God's essence. God's infinite intrinsic worth, God's substance, what he's made of, his essence. Glory can also be the invisible qualities of God. Again, his intrinsic worth, right? Made visible. So when it is made visible, it is then the glory of God. And we find that the word glory can be used to speak of honor, to talk about someone being renowned, which is well known. Um, it is uh, used to to talk about divine quality, the unspoken manifestation of God and God's splendor. So we've got all of these different definitions around this one word, glory. And so what I wanted to do was uh, one particular scripture stuck out to me as I was thinking about um, self-esteem. And that was John 17, verse 22. And it is Jesus's prayer now, not for himself, not for the apostles, but this part of Jesus's prayer regarding those of us who would one day know him because of the message of the apostles. John 17 and 22 says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus says here that he has given us, those who believe the message of the apostles, the same glory God gave to him. In this sense, the word glory is the personal opinion that expresses intrinsic value. When Jesus came to earth, his ministry was so important that he had to be secure in who he was, and he had to be secure in what he was sent here to do. In Luke chapter 2, for example, in verse 49, when Jesus and his family um, go to Jerusalem and his family loses him, and they're looking for him, and when they find him, Jesus is in the temple and Jesus says, didn't you know I would be about my father's business? Jesus knew why he was here. He knew who he was. He knew intrinsically what was inside of him, right? Again, another example would be when, when Jesus is going to the river to be baptized by John the Baptist. When he approaches John, John said, it should be you baptizing me. But again, Jesus knows who he is, right? He knows his value. But Jesus said to John, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John baptized him. Okay. Now, when we look at John chapter 13, verse three, Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. What that tells me is that Jesus possessed a solid intrinsic worth 
that could not be destroyed by people. It could not be destroyed by the circumstances or the situations that he was going to face on earth. In his prayer, Jesus asked God to restore to him the glory, God's good opinion of him, the honor and the praise that was his before the world began. I want to then now look at this thought for us because I think sometimes we just don't put it all together to really see the full picture of Christ and his glory and his work um, until we take our time to really study. So now when we think of Jesus asking God, right, to restore to him the glory that he had before the world began. When we look at John chapter one, verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. We have seen God's good opinion of him. We have seen the invisible qualities of God made manifest in him. And notice that the end of John 1 and verse 14 says, full of grace and truth, those, indiv- those invisible qualities of God, the essence of who God is. We s- we've seen it in Christ Jesus is what John says in John 1 and 14. Jesus's self-esteem was his glory. It was him exercising his personal opinion of himself, God's infinite intrinsic worth, God's substance, God's essence. That was Jesus's glory. And that allowed him to endure all the harsh treatment and ill treatment that he received when he was here on earth. Psychologists suggest that people with low self-esteem may have experienced or have gone through harsh criticism, gone through childhood trauma, but Jesus did too. Isaiah 53 and 3 says, he's talking about Jesus, it says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one of, like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and held in low esteem. Yeah, Jesus was held in low esteem. Not that he had low self-esteem, but people had low esteem of him. Mark 14, verse 65 says, then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. So when we think about all that Jesus endured and and how he was able to endure, it was because of the glory that he possessed within himself, right? And I thought about, you know, people with low self-esteem who may have had parents who were not caring for them. But there was a point where Jesus had to really face the fact that his father literally, I don't want to, he didn't forsake him, but the God dumped everything on Jesus as if he did not care for him. Second Corinthians 5, 21 says, for our sake, He made him to be sin. Wait, he made him. God is the he. God made his son to be sin. And we know how God feels about sin, right? Something that God can't stand to be in his presence. But God made him sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. So when we talk about not having self-esteem because of um, how our parents treated us or things that we have gone through, I want you to know that Jesus faced those challenges, but he had 
his self-esteem in his glory. He had a good self image. He had a good self opinion. He had the invisible qualities of God within him. And because of that, he was able to actually carry out what God had assigned for him to do. Think about how assured Jesus had to be in his self-esteem to follow the will of his father who let him be accused and receive the consequence for something he did not do. Jesus was able to do it because of the glory that he possessed. When Jesus knew that he was leaving, he prayed for us. And he said that he has given us the same glory, the same personal opinion, intrinsic worth, substance, essence, uh, the invisible qualities of God. He has given to us the same glory. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18 says, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Jesus's prayer was for those of us who believe in him based on the message we received. When Moses went before the Lord and came back in the presence of the Israelites, he had a veil on his face because the glory, the manifestation of God's splendor was so bright that they couldn't stand it. But the people had to rely on Moses to know what God had spoken. This is no longer the case for us. It doesn't matter who we are or what we've done. If we've accepted Christ, we now reflect his glory, the invisible qualities of God being made visible our substance, our essence. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. He, Christ, is changing us from the inside out because of his light that now dwells in us. See, we are undergoing a metamorphosis, which is this transfiguring process, it's the same process that Jesus went through on the Mount of Transfiguration. It begins with us receiving and exercising this glory that he has given us, this personal intrinsic value of our worth. When we accept and understand that we are children of God. I'm a child of God. You are a child of God, just as Jesus Christ is. You are a child of God. When we accept what he has given us, because he says he's given us this glory. So when we accept it, the process begins with the glory and the process is going to end in glory. When the invisible qualities of God are made visible in our lives, the splendor of God is then manifested in us as Christians. And the transformation is made. We begin to become one, not in, not in, uh, let's say in, we become, we would, we become one in principle and in purpose. Just as Jesus reflected God and did only what he heard from the Father, so we reflect Christ and we do only what we hear from him, from his word that he speaks to us through the written word, but also as he speaks to us directly in our hearts. We have been given glory. We have be, been given this extra, this exercising personal opinion of ourselves, the good opinion of ourselves about God's infinite intrinsic worth within us, God's substance and God's essence that's in us. We have been given by Jesus Christ so that we can walk in confidence and not low self-esteem. 
First John 4, 17 says, In this way, love has been perfected among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. For in this world, we are just like him. So know that you have been given glory, the same glory that Jesus possessed. He said that he gave it to us. And we are in return to manifest the invisible qualities of God here on the earth, just like Jesus did. Because in this world, we are just like him. Thank you for joining me. Please visit my website at amagohim.com and check out the coaching and leadership development services that I offer. You can find me on Instagram at amagohim or you may join me on Facebook by typing I am a G O. Be sure to like and share my weekly post. And make sure that you download the Amago podcast on Spotify or any platform. If you're on Spotify, you can check out the notes section. There's a link there uh, that allows you to support the podcast by subscribing. Uh, I want to continue to add features that will let you engage with me. So please email me some feedback at amagohim at gmail.com. And we'll see you next week. But until then, we shall be just like him.